Good morning. Um, I recently went on a work trip to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, and it did not help me do my job better. That wasn't the point, but it, the goal was to help me be a better person and to challenge my perspectives. One of the speakers that we had was a lady named Ava Breton. She's in her 90s, and she survived the Holocaust. Ava shared stories of being in two different concentration camps at age seven and eight. Her mother had died on the march to the camps, and she was separated from her father. Miraculously, she and her father both survived their respective camps. They were liberated, and they were reunited in Sweden a few years later. By this time, he had already remarried, and the new wife was now Ava's new mother. Ava's father made her promise that they would never speak of the war or the things that they went through. She went on to marry and have children, um, but she kept her life as a survivor a secret for nearly 30 years. Her own children only heard about her life in the camps when their grandfather, which was Ava's father, when he celebrated his wedding anniversary, and the years didn't quite match up with how old their own mother was. And Ava kept a portrait of her mother on her nightstand, but she had to keep the woman's identity a secret up until that time. As I listened to Ava's story, I couldn't help but feel a few things. Compassion, anguish, sadness, wonderment, but I also felt kind of far removed from it. It almost felt unreal. I've watched countless documentaries and I've read many novels set in World War II, but here she was, she was standing 20 feet in front of me, telling her story in extreme detail, and it didn't really feel too different from the documentaries that I had watched. The last of those who survived the Holocaust are almost completely gone. In not too many years from now, the stories will no longer be firsthand. It will soon be up to the next generation to pass along those stories. And the Holocaust was something that shaped Ava and other survivors like her, and yet she couldn't talk about it for many, many years. So a question that I want to ask this morning is, are we staying silent about the things that have made us who we are, namely the work of God in our lives? Can the people around us see these things? Do they know who the author of our joy is? So that brings us to the Psalms. The last five chapters of Psalms are the conclusion to the whole book. They're considered to be a hallelujah chorus. They're all really similar to each other. Um, they each begin and end with praise the Lord, which um, in Hebrew can be translated to hallelujah. So when I say hallelujah, what am I doing? Praising God, okay. That's the, the, the interpretation that we've kind of grown into, but originally hallelujah was an invitation. I'm saying to you, hey you, come and praise the Lord. So we, we may have heard, there's an old song, an old hymn, Praise Ye the Lord. These last five chapters in Psalms, they're an invitation to all to praise God. And each chapter asks a different question that helps us think about the praise that we offer. Why? Who? And how? Why? What reasons do we have to praise God? Who? Who should praise God? How? What should we use? Praise God. And we're going to consider each of these this morning. So the first one, why? What reasons do we have to praise? We have every reason to praise. Psalm 146 talks about God's nature as a compassionate God. It recounts everything that he's continuously done for us. Not only is he the maker of heaven and earth, but he's full of justice. He feeds the hungry. He frees prisoners. He performs miracles raises up the oppressed, protects the foreigner, helps the fatherless and the widow. 
He's forever faithful. He reigns forever. And there are so many places in Scripture where the people of God are retelling his greatness. Remember that time when God opened up the Red Sea and we walked through it? They're reminding themselves of everything God has done in the past and what he'll continue to do in the future. On the other hand, however, we also see them tending to forget. They begin to do things their own way because they've forgotten the mercy and the greatness of God. One thing that I think is really important for our faith is to continue to recount how we've been blessed by God and how he's come through for us. It's always a great idea to have your own little list that you've memorized so that at any given time you can recall God is worthy of praise and he's trustworthy because of one, two, and three. As you know, Pete and I, the kids, um, we lived as missionaries in South Africa for several years. And I could tell you about lots of times where we were down to maybe 10 bucks and we knew that maybe the car insurance was due the next day. Incredibly, somebody would send us money just in time. And Harmony and Lesady, they each have their own stories that they like to share uh, whenever we talk about miracles. Lesady will tell you that at six weeks old, he got a chest x-ray, and we were told that he had an enlarged heart. We were really scared at the time. We didn't know what that meant for his future. Um, but God comforted us. He assured us that he was with us. We had lots of people praying for us. And it turned out that one of his glands was casting a shadow over his heart, and he was perfectly healthy. And Harmony will tell you that when she was five years old, the pastor of our church in Johannesburg was playing with her, threw her up in the air, and couldn't catch her in time. She cracked her skull, she broke her arm, and it was a miracle that she didn't have brain swelling or more serious injuries. But there's also a financial miracle in that story as well. When we were living there, we were on and off of medical insurance. Um, and we had canceled it right after Lestady was born. And when he was about three, I felt this prompting from the Holy Spirit that we needed to start up our medical insurance again. I had made some calls to get different quotes, and I finally settled on a, an insurance company. Our coverage would start on January 1st, and the first payment would come out of our account on January the 7th. Harmony's accident was on January 5th. The insurance company assured us that everything would be covered so long as we didn't miss that first payment two days later. So what are your two or three events that you store up, that you hold close to your heart, that help you remember that God is with you, he's for you, and he's utterly worthy of praise? Another reason we praise God is that he is incomparable. He has no equal. I'm sure we've all seen these movies where good and evil is portrayed as fairly equal, right? Um, kind of evenly matched. Sometimes we have the tendency to think of God and Satan in this way, that they're somewhat evenly matched. But however, this is just not the case. God is the creator of everything, which means that he also created Satan. They're not equals. They're not even close. One of our um, pastors in South Africa used to say that Satan is just this tiny flea on the end of God's finger. It could be flipped off at any moment. Yeah, we do see the, the enemy's foothold on things of this world, but he's not like God. Psalm 148, verse 13, says, For his name alone is exalted. And then if we go to Psalm 96, it says, Because the Lord is great and so worthy of praise, he is awesome beyond all other gods, because all the gods of the nation are just idols. But it is the Lord who created heaven. Greatness and grandeur are in front of him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And God is also unlike man or human. In Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4, it tells us that putting our trust in people will lead to disappointment. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There's no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. Man's thoughts, plans, and endeavors will perish with death. 
Mortal men cannot save us. Yet God is immeasurably great and more glorious than all things on earth. If we turn um, to Psalm 148, verse 14, this is really interesting. Um, It says, he has raised up a horn. And this horn is a symbol, when you think of like a a bull, when they're fighting um, and they've won, they raise up their horn in victory. And this is God, He's, he's demonstrating that he has brought victory to his people. All creation is rescued by the Messiah. So why do we praise? Psalm 150, verse 2, it sums it up really nicely. Um, We praise him for his powerful acts and for his abundant greatness. We praise him for every reason, for what he does, but also for who he is. And now we turn to the question of who. Who should praise? Let's start with creation. The whole creation praises the Lord in Psalm 148. Every created thing praises him. Um, If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Psalm 148, I just want to look at the progression of the the verses. And you'll see that it follows the creation story of Genesis 1. It begins by saying, praise him from or in the heavens. So in the beginning, God created the? Heavens and? Okay, there we go. So in this first part of of 148, it outlines the angels, the heavenly host, the sun and moon, shining stars, the waters over the heavens. Then the psalmist moves to the earth or to the land. Praise the Lord from or in the earth. All the creatures in the sea, the lightning and hail. He talks about nature, the mountains and the hills. What's mentioned next is the fruit trees, the cedars, the wild animals, the cattle, creatures that crawl, flying birds. Sound familiar? There are many scriptures that tell us that just because they are a created thing under the authority of the creator, they praise him. By doing what they were created to do, they are praising their creator. Let's go to Psalm 98, 7 to 9. It says, Let the sea resound in everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. In Isaiah 55, verse 12, the mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. How do the mountains and the hills burst into song by their beauty, by feeding the animals that graze there, by producing fruit on the trees. They are fulfilling their God-given ability. As we know from the creation story, after creating the heavens, the earth, the seas, the light, the vegetation, and all the animals, he created something that was the crown of creation. I wanna ask the kids, What did God create on the sixth day after the animals? Yeah? I heard Harmony say people. Yeah, Adam and Eve, he created us. There was only one thing that God called very good, and that's us. All right, going back to Psalm 148, uh, starting at verse 11 here. Who should praise? Kings of the earth and all nations. You princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. All humanity is mentioned in those verses. Kings, princes, rulers, young, old, children. Everybody falls somewhere in there. Let all peoples praise. Psalm uh, 67. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. People from all corners and nations of the earth are invited to sing his praise. Every tribe, every language. Got a a bonus question in here. When do we praise? Well, we can't praise him too much. In fact, our praise doesn't even compare to his matchless glory but we have to try and give him the praise that he's due 
because that's what he deserves. Praise is essentially thanksgiving and blessing, showing gratitude to God. We should be doing this constantly, consistently. It should be like the air that we breathe. May our very lives offer praise to God. We've come now to the crux here. Psalm 150, verse 6. Let every living thing praise the Lord. Or in the NIV it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything with a breath returns its praise using that same breath back to its initiator. Psalm 146, 2. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Or essentially, as long as I'm breathing. May I praise God. With every breath he has given me, I turn back to praise him. 146, verse 10. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. He reigns forever. Let us let his legacy live on forever. He's God to all generations. This was not something that's only for the Israelites, the Jews during that time. He's God of all generations. And we have to make sure that all generations know the grace and the mercy of God so that they too can praise him. He isn't just the God of our grandparents' generation. He isn't just the God of our generation. He's the God to all generations. How? What's in your hand? 150 verses 3 and 5 says, Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. We praise in every way and with every expression. The different instruments represent different kinds and different classes of people here. Some of these instruments were used by priests, others by Levites, and still others by women. And they're all used slightly differently. This is an orchestra. There's brass instruments, wind instruments, string instruments, and percussion. So look around you. What do you have that can be used to praise the Lord? Everything can be used. And praise and worship is not simply the job of the worship leader. Every one of us has a responsibility to praise God with whatever we have. Lucky for us, we're not created the same. Just like the diversity among the musical instruments listed here, there's diversity in the family of God and in the gifts and the talents that we bring. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul outlines the different kinds of spiritual gifts that God gives. Um, I'm just going to read part of it here, starting at verse 4. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. He goes on to outline the different gifts here. There's the gift of wisdom, gift of knowledge, gift of faith, gift of healing, power to perform miracles, gift of prophecy, gift of the discerning spirit, gift of tongues, interpretation. And then verse 11 says, it is, the, it is one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So this implies that we don't all have the same gifts. Again, there's the variety in the spiritual gifts that we bring to one another. Just like the different instruments make up a beautiful orchestra, so our lives and our spiritual gifts complement one another and support each other in doing the good works that we were made for. Ava's last words that morning a few weeks ago was, tell your families, share my story, tell everyone. So is our praise private? Do our children, our grandchildren, do they see the power of God in our lives? Is the mystery of God and the legacy of Jesus going to die with us? Or will the future generation see us praising the Lord? At the beginning, I mentioned that Ava's story felt a little bit distant. Is that how we see God, that he's distant? 
do we see him as more than just the God of our ancestors? In the book of Luke, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees when they, they try to ask Jesus for, for the... He rebukes the Pharisees when they try to get Jesus to quiet his disciples, and he tells them if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. There's so many reasons to celebrate and to praise that even the rocks will cry out if we're silent. I want to go back to the beginning here at um, Psalm 146, verses 7 to 9. It talks about God's heart of compassion and what he does for us. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. These don't seem like reasons to stay silent. The very first line in, in Psalm 1, the very beginning of the book, the first word is blessed. And the last line is praise the Lord. So this is what a life looks like that has been blessed by God. When we know what God has done for us, Praise is our natural response. Everything that is created has a means of expression, whether it's through words, gestures, actions. Some of you sitting here today may be facing difficulties. You're struggling to find a reason to praise God. But if you search with all your heart, you'll discover reasons to praise him, no matter how dire the situation may seem. So I urge you to place your trust in the everlasting God, seek out reasons to praise him, and use all that you have, your hands, your heart, your gifts, your experiences, to offer a worthy expression of worship. So we're gonna just take a moment to close our eyes, to reflect on finding reasons to praise as the worship team comes.